this is the first lecture that I want to give in a series of lectures in which I transition into talking about the hidden Markov model and some of the typical algorithms that are used in order to solve for different aspects of them. The hidden Markov model is based on the Markov model, and I know that some of you are familiar with this. We've talked about this a little bit in class, but I'd like to make sure that we have a good solid foundation on it before, and that the um, notation for the Markov model is consistent. So as we move into the hidden Markov model, uh, we'll be able to transition between those two ideas easily. So this is part one of the hidden Markov model. Now, in machine learning, previously what we have talked about is the idea of just basic classification without any hidden Markov model, without anything involved with series at all. We treated classification like a spreadsheet, at least the data was like a spreadsheet, where each column in our spreadsheet was a feature, and each row was a set of features selected from those columns, and one of those columns was a class that we were trying to predict. And that prediction, when we didn't know what that final class was, that prediction was based on the set of features that was in the row of that spreadsheet. And each row had one example, one data example, and if you had a very large data uh, spreadsheet or some other data sets like that, you would train your model based on each row that you had. So for example, in class, we looked at data from the vending machine. And we knew that we had information about what time different sales were made, and we had a category about what was being sold, chips, drinks, or candy. And the goal was to try and take the, that row of data that was on the left and come up with some way of predicting what that column on the right was based on the data on the left. But now the thing about this particular data set is that each row was independent of every other row. There was no relationship in our model between what was sold previously and what was sold next. And so when we looked at this data in depth, we had these different things that we were trying to predict, but the fact that they were in, so that the rows were in a particular order didn't matter to any of the classification techniques that we used. For example, a decision tree doesn't matter what row you put the data in. Um, linear regression doesn't matter which row you put the data, data set in. K means cluster, or um, K nearest neighbor, doesn't matter which, row, which order the rows are in. Each row is independent of the next one. The data that is in one row doesn't have any information to provide to the data of the next row. Not that that's what's happening in reality, because in reality we can imagine that if someone goes to a vending machine, they're likely to buy a drink and something else. And so maybe you could do a better job of predicting each row if you, if you assumed that the data was dependent, but what I'm saying is that in our modeling, we assumed that they were independent, not that they actually were in reality. And for the most part, assuming that independence is good enough. You do a really good job without having to consider dependence between the two rows. So we can think of that abstractly as a set of features and then some classification. And I draw the arrow from right to left because really the way we think about it is that the causality, why we see the features that we see, is driven by the choice that the person is making. So the person makes the chips, and we assume, based on our model, that that means that it's a certain time of day or a certain day of the week, etc. Nevertheless, those rows are independent of the next. So if we were to shuffle them up, any of the features, uh, any of the features, the features and the um, class have to remain coupled. That would be the keeping the integrity of the row. But the relationship between each individual, the model doesn't depend on the ordering. All right, not to elaborate, not to exacerbate this, but this is sort of the, um, not to go overboard on this, but this is one of the main differences when you get into the Markov model style of classification. All right. Now, previously, we had looked at the way in which the nucleotides in a uh, DNA sequence are ordered, and they're ordered as um, the famous double helix pattern. And without going into the biology too much, we can imagine that each rung of that ladder is described by one of four letters, A, C, T, or G. Now, because the rungs of these ladders encode for proteins that the cells will eventually make, the order matters a lot. And in fact, if we were to try and predict what the next nucleotide was in a chain, it would be, depend very much on what came beforehand. And so in this case, each row was dependent on the previous one. But if you think about this in the model that we were just looking at with respect to the vending machine, 
This data actually doesn't have any features. All we have is a class that we're trying to predict. And we're trying to predict it based on the previous class in a sequence in which the sequence does matter a lot. Now, an important part of this is that the data, when we modeled this data, again, not that this is the way it is in reality, but when we tried to model this data, we leveraged something called the Markov property. The Markov property is a mathematical modeling constraint that says that in our model, we're going to assume that even though a row is dependent on the previous row, it's only dependent on the previous row and nothing that came before it. So for example, if we have a sequence of nucleotides and we're trying to predict what the, what the next nucleotide is, trying to figure out what should be in that question mark location, uh, the Markov property says that we need to base our decision on what came beforehand, so the T, but we don't base it on anything that came before the T. What we say is we say our decision is conditionally independent of our history given our immediate predecessor. There's no dependence on the previous history that isn't completely contained in the information that comes from just the previous nucleotide. And when we modeled this, we said, oh, okay, well, there's some distribution over the letters that follow. So given that we have a T previously, the next letter can be an A, C, T, or G, and there's going to be some probability of what that is. And so if we're just going to predict the maximum probability next letter, well, we predict all other things being equal, that G is the most likely thing to come next. It, this is, this is um, fictitious data. It's not based on an actual genome. Okay, so that's what we've got. We've got a Markov model in which we have a sequence that matters. We have a Markov property in which we're conditionally independent of our history, given our immediate predecessor. And we're trying to decide what should, how should we classify our next instance based just on our previous instance. All right, let's stop there and take a moment to reflect on that and make sure we, we've got that before we move into more math. Thank you.